Yep. Uh, so I've been working on a, a project um, called Recursor, and let me pull the bits and pieces out of my bag here to pass around because it's always fun to have actual bits of hardware to look at. So uh, um, my background is I, I, I'm a hardware engineer. I build hardware. I also have recently been writing a lot of software. Um, this is the device I've been building. Uh, and you guys can kind of like pass it around. Um, and the idea is to build some piece of trustable hardware for everyday use, everyday use, right? Uh, and the question is, is like, you know, I guess why do we care to build even trustable hardware or something like this? I did a, if you have your password and you store it on your phone and you put it in one password in the cloud or something like that, how do you know that, you know, it's secure and someone isn't also able to read it? It's a lot of guarantees from vendors and a lot of um, uh, mission management that goes on. And so a lot of a lot of the origin of the project comes from thinking about how do I know where the trust comes from? How do I know if the code that I'm running is actually the code I think I'm running? Um, and there's a thing called kind of a root of trust. The idea is that like there's a piece of hardware that can guarantee there's an unalterable ground truth that you can cryptographically verify that um, your code base is what you're running. Uh, a lot of uh, like phones and computers use these uh, hardware roots of trust. You've heard them in names like secure enclaves or TPMs or these type of like BitLocker or something like this. They're all based on some bit of hardware. The problem is that the hardware isn't invaluable. There's a lot. Of, there's been cases where, for example, people have put like this is a phone that had a backdoor installed uh, that could like take the phone call and transmit it remotely while you're on the call. Um, it's known that they will take routers and divert them on the way to uh, their end customer, open up the routers and put alternate firmware on the inside, and then put it back in the box and ship it along. Um, and then you know people have found like uh, implants inside cloud servers that have the, they have this little diagnostic port called JTAG, and they have hardware that can go ahead and, and do really low level access to the servers on the inside. And then you know people say, okay, well then why do I have to worry about this? Like you know we're talking about like state level adversaries going after like really you know high end stuff. The problem is is that there's actually now kind of a class of everyday packs for everyday targets, which is enabled by the fact that we buy everything online. So the classic sort of routine is, say you want to do some cryptocurrency and you want to store it in a little hardware wallet that you get, which is a place, another type of root of trust. You don't have to go to uh, be so sophisticated to intercept a package and on the way to your door or something like this, particularly if you don't want to be particularly specific, you just want the cryptocurrency. What they do is they buy the wallet on the local store, Lazada, Amazon, or something like this, they open it up, they hack it, they return it. And then when it goes into the return process, it gets sold to another person. And they don't, you don't, can't really control who it gets sold to, but at the end of the day, if you can go ahead and recover the crypto, uh, the, uh, so the cryptocurrency that's put in it, the, the goal has been accomplished, right, at the end of the day. So there's, there's more and more evidence that this is becoming a, a um, Sort of a practical target. The, the reason why I think most people you don't hear about this more is actually it's still easier to just pick you to send your OTP, right? Just call you up and say, oh, hey, like I'm so and so, your good friend. I'm locked out of my account. Can you just send me like an OTP that I sent you? You know, that, that's a still an easier path than doing this. But as people become more aware, it becomes more difficult. This becomes, uh, you know, sort of the last resort for a lot of these attacks. The problem is, is that, like, um, you know, when you look at sort of the roots and trusts, uh, you know, everything looks solid based on theory, but if you start to look down, you find them just floating in the air, right? There's no, there's no ground truth. And the big problem is actually, um, how many people here know what a hash algorithm is? You guys know the digital signatures or hashing? A little bit. Okay. So uh, when you download a, an update from the internet, sometimes you'll see this thing where it says, like, uh, if you use Windows, it will say like this thing is not trusted or it's been signed, you know, and or if you, you know, I don't know quite how it works in the Mac system, but oftentimes there's some little thing that tells you it's been that the update is good. So how that works is they actually take the, the binary code, which is actually just a string of numbers, they do some math on it and they turn it into a very short number that uh, is cryptographically linked to that program. And then they use a thing called a private key to sign it. And then they can distribute a public key, which can be used to verify the signature at the end of the day. This trick is what allows you keeps. So if someone was say, if you're downloading that piece of software on your computer, and someone were to hide in the middle and swap out that software while it's being downloaded, when you bring it to your site and you, you, you check the math on it, it doesn't work out. 
right? That's called hashing and signatures. The problem is for hardware, you don't have the equivalent of that. When you receive a computer in the mail, you can't put it in a magical box that finds the one atom that's out of place from the original intended design at the end of the day, right? So you can't hash hardware, you can't sign it. So there's a there's a there's a class of attacks called a kind of check to kind of use attack, which is if you're in you know sort of doing hacking, this is one of the things you look for. You say, uh, when did the person check that this is authentic versus when you use it? So for example, if you rely on the server to check that your software package is good and you download it, then the check is on the server, but the use in your laptop, and everywhere from the server down to your laptop, someone can change it, and then you can be vulnerable, which is why the check happens on your laptop, not on the server, right? The problem with hardware is that we check at the factory, but then it gets to your home. And there's the time to check at the factory, but then there's a whole uh, path between your factory and your home where it's a problem. And so, you know, I've, I've been on record saying that you can always pack hardware, you can always look at hardware, you know, you can't hide secrets in hardware, whatever it is. It's true, right? But the problem is, is that this is the reverse situation. You can take one piece and find the secrets on the inside, but now we're asking to check everyone's hardware, like everything that people download. So there's a technology that's available where I can take the, the latest kind of CPU and I can get like three dimensional images. Of the construction of the CPU down to the transistor level, these tiny, tiny little transistors, right? It's really cool stuff. It's called tachographic x ray imaging. The problem is, is that you have to have a microscope inside of the building. This is the light source for that particular microscope. You're not going to have this in your flat, right? You're not going to be able to even put it in every single country. And so now you're against a time of check to time of use problem again, where, you know, the situation is I can mail it to this microscope. I could I could spend the bazillions of money to turn it on and power the energy, whatever it is, and inspect the thing through, and then you mail it back, and then again, it's something to swap it out and it, as it goes to your house, right? So you have this problem still. The other problem is that some people say, okay, well, I can just check one processor, it's fine. Just make sure the Intel CPU is okay, just buy the Intel CPU. The problem is just checking one chip only checks that one chip. It doesn't say anything about the, ver the verification of all the chips. And it's particularly a problem for people who have like uh, hyperscale cloud services. You have like 10,000 servers in the room. If even one of them is compromised from the inside and is able to read the traffic of the other servers, it can be a big compromise of the overall security model. So you don't have to, you know, if, if you just sample the, the servers going in, it's still not good enough. So the question at the end of the day, I'm trying to answer with this little product of mine is can we actually build evidence based trust in your computers? How do we get around? Sort of the idea that we can have like, you know, implants and people hacking the actual hardware itself. It's a hard problem. And, uh, you know, I kind of made, kind of broke it down into three principles that I tried to solve in this project. Um, first principle is that we can't make it too complex because we don't have a hashing function for hardware. We have to make it simple at the end of the day. The second thing is we have to verify the whole system, not just the components. It's very tempting to say, I'm just going to check this one chip, everything else will be fine. Uh, I'll talk about problems later. And then also I want to have to empower people who get the hardware to, to check it at home. If you say I can only check in the factory, that's not good enough, right? So the first thing is that, you know, complexity is, is complicated, right? So even if I gave you all of the design for this phone here, right? And you could go ahead and try to verify it. You, you're going to have to break the phone basically to check it. Right. And then also it's just taking too long. By the time you finish checking, you want to buy a new phone anyways, because it's like, you know, it's been a, a year-long project for you, right? So um, so there's a so when we think about the problem space, the question is, do we really need to have a hundred million transistors inside my headphones? Right? Does it really deliver the benefit we're looking for versus like the classic headphone headset? Literally, this thing has one transistor, it's the transistor inside the microphone, it's a little JFET device. And everything else works on just a magnet mounted around a coil or whatever it is, and then you can use kind of like the physical principle is very simple. So these two products, the you know, the earpods and the headphone, ostensibly do the same thing. The difference is one has a wire, the other one does not, right? At the end of the day, this one is almost impossible to check. This one's very easy to check, right? And so if you were worried about if that were an attack vector, you would obviously go for a much simpler approach, right? So there's a lot of sort of um, trade-offs that, uh, that are that go into into designing a system like this. The second thing is that you need to design the whole, you have to check the whole system. So if you look at like a typical phone these days, a lot of them have, if you've heard like Samsung Knox or like Apple's secure enclave, they talk about this little chip that keeps your key secret, right? And like, oh, you should, you should feel safe because this is a little chip that keeps your key secret, right? That guy over there. The problem is, is that uh, it only keeps 
the secret inside this kit. So, the, so some people who in Android you may have seen the screen where you can uh, install a, uh, a new keyboard, and it'll actually tell you, say, this is the method to collect all the texting types, including virtual data, passwords, and credit card numbers, right? And then you just click OK. You don't even think about it. You just, like, you sure your passwords are kept in here, but you just gave this other app the authorization to also copy your passwords, right? And clicking that, right? So the problem at the end of the day is that there's this whole path where you type it in, it gets to the state, they, they keep it secret, but then they have to put it on the screen so they decrypt it, right? And so the private keys are not the same as your private banners, right? At the end of the day. And this is actually like a part of the reason why some governments are less worried about end to end encryption is because if they can just back to all the IME, they put method editors, particularly like Chinese and very complicated language, you have to have a skill program in addition that does it. But if you can back all of those, then you have the conversation from both ends. People are typing things, you just correlate by time, and you, have, you, don't, you don't care if it's encryption in the middle at the end of the day, right? So this is called the IME problem. So that's why I think you have to check the whole system end to end, not just one chip. And the final thing is you have to empower end users to check the hardware. So, and when I say check, I don't mean just like looking at the circuit board where it is, but you know, you can use it to verify my design is correct. So we can have like an academic discussion about the merits of my random number generator or something like this. And also we, we worry about like the, the design of the chip itself. So let me share the screen, sorry. Hmm. Oh, there's people on Zoom can't see it. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry Zoom people. Is that okay? So that's the video part. Yeah. Okay. You good? Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. No worries. Yeah. So I was just saying that like, you know, we have to we have to share uh, the the data at multiple levels. So we can talk about not just the circuit board, but also the circuit level design, and we can talk about more abstract issues like the design of the chip itself, right? So, um, wait, advance the presentation. There you go. So, this little device I've been handing around for people who aren't on Zoom. You look at it. It's a little, it's a little device that it, it's kind of a, a little bit of a, a pseudo academic study. It's, you know, it's commercial, but it's very, you know, the, the work is kind of pushing this, this very edge of the direction. And the idea is to facilitate evidence based trust. So it's not, so you don't have to trust me. People say, like, why do I trust you? You're some random guy in Singapore, right? You're, then you call yourself a hacker. Like, can I put your like, passwords in the hacker's thing? It's like, you don't have to trust me, right? I'm going to give you something that's simple in construction, open in design, and sufficient in, in function that you can go ahead and just verify yourself. Um, it's designed for things, the applications like secure messaging or voice chat, it has multi digital capability. You can do password management or crypto wallet with it, but you're not going to be able to do things like web browsing or games or photos and videos on it, right? This is part of that, again, that complexity trade off, right? So if you want to go ahead and have downloadable apps and expect security, those two run counter to each other, right? Because every single time you put something from the internet on your device, that's a new attack surface you, you integrate. Whenever you visit the internet, pretty much every single website today has JavaScript. That's an arbitrary piece of code that you will allow to run on your computer in the same program ostensibly that has a password manager that's keeping your passwords, right? So, I mean, you can already see the beginning of how the madness starts and we can, you know, draw the draw, draw the connection to the end. There's, there's a lot of things that you don't do with device um, to keep it secure. So, the, the, the hardware itself is deliberately simple and constructed. So, there's a lot of, this is basically everything inside of, inside of the, 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 the device. I brought along bits and pieces of it. If you guys want to just kind of look at it, uh, you know, you can these are more parts, like prototypes and stuff of the actual hardware. You can see the metal case, the CNC metal case, and the actual. Don't worry about it. They're all, they're all, they're they're dummy parts. So you can go ahead. And, it's not a problem if you draw. But, um, but the idea is, yeah, it's, it's very simple and easy to take apart. It's it, you know, it uses um, screws and not glue to hold together. And so, for example, we take deliberately take a physical keyboard. So people say, well, why not touch screen, right? You know. Uh, you know, with the physical keyboard, you know, it's it's visually inspectable. Right? You can basically take the, the circuit board for the physical keyboard and you can hold it up to the light. And you can see, okay, these are the switches, these little dots here are the switches, and this is the wires, and there's the connector. That's it. That's, that's everything between your passwords and the microprocessor. There isn't like this other chip 
that interprets your hits on the touch screen and some virtual process and translate to and all the sort of stuff you have to verify. This is a very, very simple mechanism for, for inputting data. The problem with like a touch touch keyboard verification is that like a lot of these packet up screens, they have like this is a data sheet for like one of the controllers on the inside. And you'll notice they have a firmware on the inside. You know, they'll, they'll, and they don't even specify it's firmware 1.x or whatever it is. They, you can't get that firmware to look at. They won't just not open source, whatever it is, and have backdoors. So it's a it's a big problem to check that. The screen itself on the device is designed, is, is, is chosen to be one that's easy to verify. So uh, at the end of the day, if you were to go ahead and take this screen and put it under the microscope, this is a regular optical microscope. So one of those little just complicated kind of biology class 50 at Zoom. You can actually see the individual um, driver transistors on at that, at that resolution. You can actually, these are, these are the actual decoders for the pixels right on the edge of it. A lot, the problem with a lot of the other, uh, if you look at like more like a, of a color screen or something like this, if you were to take a TV or a smaller um, screen, you'll see a little bar sitting along the edge of several of them. This is actually a silicon chip. So it's a weird shaped one, it's very long and thin, right? But it's actually fabricating a very high end process, it has a frame buffer, it has an IO interface. So again, this is another attack surface that's difficult to, to enumerate. So this, this device, you can see we're already sort of trying to go to that down that lunatic fringe of like how how verifiable can we get right there's other companies you know, well, practically speaking people want color screens but black and white's easier to check um and then the motherboard itself is you know we we made it single-sided we have actually guides that we publish on the internet so if you care you can look at it and i can tell you what the differences are what they do and what they should look like at the end of the day and you know because the problem is is that if someone adds something to the board you're not going to know it it's too complicated. This one, this one tries to call out all the bits and pieces. And then the circuit board itself is designed particularly to isolate everything that matters into a single domain called the trusted domain. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that you don't have to worry about as much. And so then, you know, to make it even easier for you to say, look at these few things. You don't have the time to look at everything. Look at these things. And then you can, you're probably fine, right, at the end of the day. So we tried to make that a little bit easier for people to verify. Um, the hardest problem is that the CPU itself, or as we sometimes call it, the SOC system on chip, it's, it's you. Well, how do you verify a chip? We go back to that slide I said, where you have to have the building side microscope. And this is a wonderful SEM image of a chip you can see everything through, but you'll notice something, they cut the chip. You know, if you, once you do this, the chip doesn't work anymore. So we can see everything on the inside, but we can't, we can't really see it and use it at the same time. The solution we use is a piece of uh, it's an off-the-shelf component it's called a field programmable gate array, FPGA, right? And so uh, what an FPGA is, it's you can imagine just a sea of logic. Any, anyone here take digital architecture class or anyone like just programming these days? It's, it's, it's like digital logic part of the course mandatory for NUS if you get a CS degree anymore. I'm wondering. No, probably not. It used when I was when I was your age. <laughs> we all had to learn about gates and flip flops, right? So that was a mandatory aspect of education. Anyways, there are these primitives that compose your computer called gates and registers. And the idea here is that you just get a bunch of them with arbitrary wiring between them. You can specify them, which allows you to essentially take a generic piece of hardware. And turn it into anything you want, a microprocessor, an AI processing chip, uh, you know, something that plays Pong directly in hardware, not by code, but you know, directly in hardware. And so the, the concept here is that we actually narrow the time of check to time of use gap by allowing people to compile their microprocessor from a description of its software. So the actual device itself, when it ships to you and the power is off, it doesn't have a microprocessor in it, honestly. Right? It's just an FPGA, it doesn't do anything. You can actually compile your own microprocessor description, put it on, and you will have your very own microprocessor version for your own chip that's specific to your device. And so one of the one of the really neat parts about it, let me see if I have a slide about that. Yeah, I'll show I'll tell you in a minute. So one of the neat parts about it is that you can actually look inside the entire chip itself. So you can say, okay, here's the processor core, the crypto elements, but the input and output. This is a typical diagram for a system on chip these days. If you begin to embedded firmware or something, you'll see these. And then it actually takes that and maps it down to see what the CA dates looks like. And I can, you can actually see like this is the CPU core, this is the hashing DIM, this is the T-ROM, 
This is the cryptography with the with the public key stuff, AES, you know, these types of things. And you actually see the location of these. And the cool the cool part is that every time you compile that code, it actually changes a little bit. The location of the specific gates is not deterministic between each compilation. So if someone were to say, okay, I know you're going to compile it, but I still want to see your data. They can't say, I'm just going to put something here and steal your data. They have to put something everywhere in the chip to potentially steal the data that you're looking for, which greatly changes the size of the chip, greatly changes the power signature. So it's very likely you'll be able to detect someone who's doing this. So that's, that's kind of the end run that we do around uh, the silicon verification issue. So the actual, it's really neat if you get into like the CPUs and stuff, um, the whole core itself, it's open source down to like, so you can actually look at the instruction decoder, see the instructions being being implemented. You can add your own instructions if you want to, right? Um, you know, and it's it's a rich five CPU core. It's like fully tweaked. I mean, if you're kind of into like tweaking and modding, this is like, it's a lot of fun. It's like, you know, I spent like some gratuitous time trying to play with cache sizes and cache lines, trying to optimize performance. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. But the um, the biggest advantage at the end of the day is that we're again moving the point of check closer to the end user, right? So you can imagine at the end of the day, maybe if you don't want to compile it yourself, we can make a tool that is all open source that correlates the bitstream you have to the source code. That tool doesn't exist today, but we have uh, a lot of the, the primitives we need to write that. Um, but this, but at, but now we're not looking at sort of like the factory guaranteeing the correctness. Um, we're sort of looking at users guaranteeing the correctness of their own CPUs. So the, the hard part about all this is, you know, how do we get the human computer interface, right? So we're talking about the hardware, right? you know, sort of like how do we balance between function and sort of what people want? So people at the end of the day, they want everything in the browser and one phone, right? And then at the, at, 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 at sort of the other stream, then uh, maybe you see face, you do like little tokens like this, the single use, all they do is if you do a little six digit number, maybe you can type a number in and come back. This, this is a little, Cryptographic enclave, they can do exactly one thing, which is talk to your bank application. And then if you have like five banks, you have five of these now, right? You know, and so it becomes annoying. This one kind of sits in the middle where you can just kind of embed a bunch of these virtually into this device. So it can do, it can pick a bunch of all those, but it can't take the function of this because this is a little bit too hard to analyze at the end of the day. So that's kind of where it sits. Um, and sort of making the case for where it sits in the overall spectrum, you can sort of say, you know, if you want to look at Devices that fit your pocket. A lot of them, you know, what those are, right? There's a bunch of devices that are also hackable. You can get a Raspberry Pi, you can get a Sigur Google and Arduino, those things that are hackable, right? Um, but a lot of them are not actually explicitly built for being analyzable for evidence based processing. They don't have like a software CPU, they don't have an FPGA on the inside. And so, you know, this particular device occupies a Sort of that little bit of landscape in the middle where you have all those three attributes um, put together. So, like a functionally equivalent piece of open hardware, you can buy if you don't want it, if you can't afford one of my devices, you can do something fun. You can even get one of these. It's like an FPGA. It's a, it's totally open. It's affordable, but it doesn't have a screen or keyboard, right? So that's a downside. It doesn't have. It's not fully integrated. It's a little hard to carry in your pocket. If you want to just go for like full open hardware phone. Uh, you can do that. They, they, they exist today. Um, they have open source software stacks. They have a browser, they're pocket ready. The problem is that you can't, it runs a fixed CPU. So the CPU itself has a vulnerability. You can't know it. You can't find out what's going on, on the inside. Um, and then at the end of the day, even if you have this, you might end up carrying two devices in practice because you just can't run all the software that your Android or iOS phone can run. Um, so at the end of the day, what we're trying to look for is something that, that it looks like a gadget fits in your pocket, but it doesn't have compromises. So uh, talking a little bit more about the construction of the device. So yeah, I, I thought I would kind of pivot a bit from telling what it is to a little bit more about how it's made so we can have a conference table and serve an AMA about the construction. So, you know, building a uh, hardware gadget is a multidisciplinary exercise, right? So my background is a uh, electrical engineer, right? But I've had to pick up along the way Things like metallurgy, uh, mechanical engineering, plastics, uh, a bunch of design to sort of make this happen. So you need to pick up a bunch of these little uh, aspects to go ahead and build like actual physical cases. So there's a bunch of different prototypes we, we went through to try and get to the final physical cases that you're that you're looking at today. The general process is we 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 it's called kind of sketching and hardware. The idea is to make it cheap and easy to iterate through your design concepts. So the first thing I did is it's kind of classic. You know, we think look at the, the existing research in HCI stuff. So like I, you know, 
Is there really anything confident with someone building a phone case to have a display on it that could give like a little black and white display? Is he like some sort of security idea? No, the, the intention for it was that you can like put your boarding pass with a plane on the little black and white display, turn off your phone, and you could like scan it and a, you know, a bunch of little fun things like this. That kind of inspired the overall idea of this as a companion to the phone. <clears throat> we started going in e like they had done originally. So we've got some e examples. You can see this is like not plugged into anything that still has to be on the screen because that's what e does. That's actually a problem with e because if you have a secret on your phone and someone steals your phone from you, you can't clear this. It's still on the screen, right? So that's all the downside of using e, right? Um, anyways, we then took this to the Raspberry Pi. We just built like this very simple circuit board, twenty dollars circuit board. Took like you know a couple of days to to hang out. You can see like the concept of the key switches here and a little place to plug in the sample display. And we just cruised it like this is not this is not a real UI. We just put the bitmap with text out of different sizes, images of different things. We want to sort of evaluate the quality of the screen. So we looked at a few different screens. We looked at them plugging them into the interface. A few different keyboards got the feel of it, you know, some other risky circuits like the random number generator got put in this whole thing. And then, you know, translated the thing to sort of like the final design, the design concept. So, this is like what I call a process of sketching and progress. So, reducing that cost of figuring out what's going on. Uh, make all your mistakes early on, basically. Then, uh, you know, we went to some factories and tried to figure out how to make, make this keyboard, right? So, first thing we did is like, so one of the classic devices that has a keyboard, this is called a Blackberry, it's probably before your age, I think. <laughs> but it used to be, you know, when we had portable devices, they only had physical keyboards before the touch screens. This was like 2002, maybe, I don't know, something like this in that, in that range. Um, and I, I got an old one and started taking it apart and seeing how they built it. Right? So I kind of understood everything. And then I went to try to figure out how do we build our home. Went to a factory, a uh, factory that and today actually the, the little the, these little keys survive on these very cheap phones they built for like the Indian and Vietnamese market that those kinds of markets where they can't afford a touch screen. And so there's still factories that build these keyboards, but in a much much simpler fashion. So we found uh, some some factories could do that, and uh, eventually managed to figure out how to build um, our keyboard. Um, and then before we actually got into any circuit design. I have a little tool uh, to go ahead and render what the things look like so we can see how the light plays on the surface, what the thickness should look like, and what, what makes it look thin. There's a lot of tricks you can play, like the beveling of the edge of a product makes it look thinner than it really is. If you get you know, if you get those shirts that have like the, the slimming stripes or something like this, you know, it's, like, it's the same same trick you play with like the light on the device to try and you know to, to, to thin it out. So so we play around a bit with that. And then uh, after we uh, after we do that, we then start building. Actual hardware. So these are just one offs. They don't look like the product that you've had in Canada. This is the first generation one offs, different materials. We're playing like your own bezel, uh, bezel, different types of keyboard, the gloss level, these types of things. So, then, so, you know, these are what I call the hand feel prototypes to see if they, you know, that thing on the, on the screen actually translates to something that actually feels good in your hand, which is actually really, so one of those things that's very hard to like turn into a science. Still, because humans are very complicated, uh, but build, building these prototypes help help with that. Then we have to pick the right material for the case. We actually went and you know I, I don't know if you remember the iPhone six debacle where the iPhone sixes would like break if you sat on them because they yeah, they use aluminum case but they use the alloy that's a little bit too weak and send them break. And so we wanted to avoid that. So we we went through a whole bunch of different we went through. Different alloys of aluminum, different alloys of brass, different alloys of steel. And so when you get the samples, they look, look like the case on you from some watch bands, actually, which are made in the same alloy that we would use for the case. And then we put some tasks. We get the billets of brass. Or, you know, I would I would take a, 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 a pocket, bring it to the to Sentosa, see how the ocean water interacts with it, take it out. You know, you don't want to bring the whole device there, but you can get these little samples, you can kind of see. How, how it all is going to interact. And so we built like a whole bunch of different varieties. It's so the same steel with different grades, stainless steel with different polishes on the back, so different grades of aluminum, two or three different types of alloys, brass, to kind of see how they all kind of bake off against you. The brass has a wonderful hand feel. It's like heavy and it's beautiful and it ages well. But the problem is, is there's no non conductive finish for it. So on, the problem is the inside of the case is also brass. And it can short everything out. That was like the big 
problem. We couldn't find a way to pass with the brass. Whereas like steel, you can actually do a thing called uh, PVD, physical vapor deposition on it to make it, uh, give it a non-conductive finish, that shiny finish you see on the outside. Um, so, that, so, and then aluminum, we can anodize. So anyways, we, we kind of did a lot of iteration there. When I get the color scheme right, so we played around with different, different concepts. Like we did something really just crazy or neat for the front to see what it looked like. I, I, yeah, whatever. We, we shipped a few of them to people. Some people like it, some people hate it, whatever. Um, and then, you know, of course, at the end of the day, plain black is what everyone buys. <laughs> no one no one goes for anything other than black. Um, and then there's, a, and then finally, after all the iteration of stuff, we get into sort of like the refinement and timing. So, you know, we actually take this concept and bring it down to like, oh, how thick is the speaker? What's the margin of the speaker? What does the gasket look like? And how much space do you have a battery? Where does the vibration motor go? Where the you know, security shields go, the keyboard circuit board, all sorts of stuff. This all now goes to the CAD tool. This is the, where the hard work happens. It takes a long time. But you see, before we got to the point of investing all the effort to do this, we did a lot of sort of confidence building to make sure that that effort, that final piece, wasn't a wasted effort to, to get all the, all the details right. Um, <clears throat> on the left one here, um, mobile, I mean, mobile phones are a common thing now today. So the good news is that there's a lot of support out there. I can basically ride on the coattails of Apple and Samsung and buy the components they use to make my device slim and small. But we had to carry the electronics. So, so the actual circuit board at the end of the day is very thin. Like no components are higher than 1.5 millimeters, which is which is a, a pretty tough spec to meet, but we were able to finally arrive at a, a, a you know a set of components that meet that. And then we uh, you know we had to get all of the finishing right. So if you look at the, the actual case itself, um, the case that you have in your head right now is an aluminum case. And then there's a little slight shine in the edge. And actually, the, the trick it's done by using a single crystal diamond to actually uh, to mill off the edge in a single go. There's no finishing done after it. And it actually gives it a shiny finish because you, you, the, 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 the bit is so sharp. It's actually the final machine finish of it. Um, and then, you know, we actually, uh, the screws are actually custom made screws. We had a build that had like a little bit of a, this, this one is not the actual screw that we use in the production, but you can see the device has a little bit, you look at play with the light, has a little bit of a radial shine to it, right? So there's a lot of little finishing touches that um, add to sort of the, the overall uh, appeal of the device. And so the other, the, hopefully at the end of the day, we managed to build a sort of a pocketable device that doesn't have a sort of too many compromises, say not, no compromises are high bar, too many compromises and ease of inspection. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm just wrapping it up. You know, this is this device here is an embodiment of those three principles I talked about. It's simple, so it's easier to inspect. You can verify the whole system. So we go from the keyboard to the display. So from your human secret to the actual digital secret and back to the human secret again. Um, and then uh, we empower end users to verify and seal their hardware. So we have, the, the, we have six screws in the front bezel. It makes it very easy to take apart. There's no sort of like adhesives on the inside. You can go ahead and get it. After it comes shipped at home, take a look at it, maybe spend half an hour checking it out, put it back together and be like, okay, yeah, this is this is this is what I expected it to be. Um oops. Can I get to the next slide? Okay. So um a little bit more about the software side of things. I, I, I focus a lot on hardware. There's actually a lot of software that goes in this thing. Uh, I would say the rule of thumb actually is uh for any project like this, you're gonna probably spend about 10 times more effort on the software than the hardware, right? So if you look at the, the composition, I, this, this information back from the early iPhone days, like the, the first iPhone was designed by a team of 15 people, hardware, but the software team was like 500 people, right? It was like crazy amount of effort on the software. So like I, I did all the hardware about two years ago. Um, and since then I've done nothing but write software, like literally nothing but write software for this thing to make it do what it does today. It's like a lot of code. But um, we have a custom OS built from the ground up. That is the, the problem with Linux is it's too complicated. Again, even though Linux is open source, I can't. I don't have enough hours in the day to look at all the lines of code in Linux. Right? It's just it's not going to work. I can't trust it. So I, we wrote our own OS from the bottom up in a language called Rust. Um, it's a systems programming language that has like strong memory safety guarantees, um, and so we were able to, you know, sort of. Have a higher standard of code, hopefully, than the C based Linux uh, code. 
And uh, we have a bunch of emulation mode done it. So we have a thing called posted mode. So you actually can develop the device itself. You can download our code base and go to our, our GitHub repo, pull it, and actually pull and emulate it. It runs on your, your machine itself. We actually have to support multiple emulation modes so we can develop applications without having to have the device itself. All the documentation is open source. There's a wiki there, there's a link for it. Um, and I get to the next page. Hello. That's interesting. So, is the last page gone on the presentation? This is. Uh, is there a. Let me try exiting the blue screen. Let's see. Screen sharing. Where and how do I exit? Oh, just escape. Oh, escape. There you go. All right, we can just leave it there. I think the, this is a uh, people online can see this, right? Okay. okay. Yeah. So this is like the, the last page in here. So this is the current status. Um, you can order the hardware today. There's a website, freeperson.dev. Um, it's available in modular silicon shortages. Like if you guys haven't heard, there's like a supply chain problem. I can I can I can talk to you your ear off about it. Um, the uh, software itself, there's a there's an application available for it that allows you to manage like TOTP, which is those little six digit numbers you have to type in. Uh, you can find out which is like if you buy a UBP, you plug it into your computer and take the, take the place of UBP and Playtex password management. So if you just want to traditional passwords, type in into the own device and, and it'll type it in by USB. It actually emulates a keyboard when you plug in your computer and it'll just magically type it in. Um, <clears throat> we're stabilizing the box code base. You can go here to take a look at all the code. And uh, maybe the final bit is that, like, we have, the people sometimes ask me, how do I get the money to do this? Uh, we actually get money, a lot of money comes from uh, a European agency called Internet, they're based in the Netherlands. Uh, you can buy, you, you guys can buy these grants. They're actually like surprisingly simple to get. That's the only condition you have to make it open source, and you have to be in theme with one of their with one of their offerings. And so the theme that I'm in is the NGI Zero grant for privacy and trust and technology. So this is like solidly in the theme. And uh, and they have grants. You can, they'll give give you anything from like you know a few thousand euros, which is a small thing you want to do, to like you know hundred of thousand euros for a bigger project, that kind of thing. And uh, and uh, and the cool thing about it is it allows us to do all the iteration, all the exploration, the prototype we did. We could do that on this grant money. We didn't have to go and raise VC. We didn't have to go and like engage, you know, get a grant from the government or something like this, have KPIs or whatever deliverables. We just basically need to get the money and figure out the thing in the day. So. Um, so this is a this is a we have a chat uh, in a uh, it's a chat system called Matrix. This is our developer room. You can go right there, and I guess we have a few minutes left. That was my goal to have uh, maybe about fifteen minutes or so for us to have the AMA part. So uh, maybe we can transition to that. Any questions? A lot of things that kind of threw at you. All at once. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you first. Oh, the device is connected to the internet. This device connect. Yeah. So the device has a Wi-Fi interface on it, um, and so the Wi-Fi the Wi-Fi actually goes through a chip that we consider untrustable because it's a closed source chip, uh, and then it goes. There's another actually a second FPJ on it uh, that I didn't talk about that has a firewall from the untrusted domain to the trusted domain. So we have like another some sacrificial chip, also open source, runs its own little kind of mini. OS on it, and it talks to the Wi-Fi chip, and then translates all the data into a simpler packet format that we can uh, manage on the device itself. So the Wi-Fi performance isn't stellar because of all the extra processing they go. They're not going to get super low latency, but it's enough to like transmit data at a rate for like a phone call, like a voice phone call, not video, really, but voice phone call. Yeah. So I'm very impressed with your product. Thanks, speaking. And I want to introduce myself to you. Actually, I'm a chief designer. Okay. For 27 years. Okay. Cool. With many companies. So what you say is very clear to me what's going on. Okay. Um. Well, in general, what, what I could say is that I mean, all my years, I have not read or seen so far that chip design, chip design company actually tries to do some sneaky things in their hardware. Right. The software is the one that is the most. Right. 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 Yeah. Because I I know your 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 effort was really uh, tremendous because you used uh, a diving FPGA or something because yeah. the gate break. 
So you could see exactly the attackers that we picked up. Yeah. Know, most of the key. Yeah. But I, but all I believe that you still see some cities and you know what they are. Sure. Yeah, 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 right. So that's why, frankly speaking, it's cool that for chip design, it's actually very easy to do something to But yeah. most companies are all mostly renowned because there's a reputation to take care of. So right. never get to do such a thing. Right. No one can really do it. Yeah, sure. So uh, it's possible, but uh, I don't think it's done in 99.99% of the company. Yeah. Uh, but but it's really a very good Thanks. Yeah. So my, my question actually is more like uh, uh, I mean since the, the OS is gonna run on the FPGA, it's gonna be pretty slow, right? Right. You know, you know, FPGA is much slower than so you're running at what kind of frequency clock? So, yeah, so the bits the, the RV32 runs at hundred megahertz. Um, and uh, our OS, because we wrote it from the ground up, it's quite efficient. Uh, we don't like, the, I think that actually, I mean, you're familiar with Moore's Law and the progress of everything. But, you know, in, in 2005, we had a Palm Pilot and it did all the things I'm talking about. And this is more, more megahertz than the Palm Pilot, right? And since 2005 until today, I think that we just added JavaScript to everything. And most of our CPU cycles is like running an interpreted. Virtual language on another machine that does another thing, that's another thing, and then finally you get down to like actual machine code that's running and you need 32 megabytes of cache just to cache the interpreter, right? It's like crazy. Like basically, that's where all those CPU cycles went, not actually doing much um, useful at the end of the day. So, so we what we do is we strip out all of that stuff. And if you play with the device, you can see that you can type on the keyboard, it's, you know, you can see that the response is not real time, but it's it's good enough for a security device, right? Um but uh, yeah, I mean that's that's one of the trade-offs we we had to face in 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 doing the device. So unless you really trust one particular CPU company and use it, then probably you'll be much faster. And 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 an FPGA consumes a lot of leakage power. Right? Yeah, we we picked a particular FPGA that's low leakage. That was that was actually one of the. Uh, if, you, if people ask me like why did I use this particular FPGA, if you look at the the leakage, this is a special low leakage version of the Xilinx FPGA that's made. Particularly for this, and so we're able. To, you know, it's a pretty thin device with a small battery. It'll run for about. If you just leave it on without any power management, it'll run for like 12, 14 hours. So it's so good, good all day. But then with a little power management, we can get it. We can get it like you know, a very acceptable run time. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I mean, to, to your comment about um, sort of the the reality of of Backdoors and silicon or something like this. There, there are actually two vectors. Um, it's not just malicious ones, but actually the more typical issue is that as your chip designer, you know that you want to have all the visibility to debug a problem in the chip. So you already have the spare cells, you have the JTAG, you have the extra gates, you have like the boot queues options, all the different things, right? Most of those are not actually documented to the end user, right? So if you are a security person and you make a security model, all those are actually actually backdoors, right? Because the problem is that someone finds out that there is a way to put the chip in a debug mode that gives you access to all the private keys without going through any of the regular security. That is completely usable by an adversary to bypass everything, right? And so one of the, the problems we have with a lot of actually secure enclave chips is that they're under so much NDA, they're so secret, you can't, we know we know that everyone does this. We're like, we're like come on, you have to have a way to debug this chip. Where is it? Tell me about it. Like, oh no, we don't have it. Like, you know, or we disabled it. Trust us. Whatever. Like, you know, this is this this is this is the number one. Actually, the more practical issue, right? And it's part of the reason why we want to do our own chip at the end of the day is we want to know what happens before the boot. Like, you know, that little fit state machine that sets up all the all the you know fused out options. The second one is actually there have been some examples of of some mass modification of chips. Um, it's a there's a really interesting case. Uh, that I have first hand information of, but it hasn't been made public. But uh, uh, I think that I think the bit of details that are publicly known about it, if you remember, there was a, a, a while back, there was an exploit that was found on a Broadcom Wi Fi chipset that affected basically every mobile phone in existence, right? There's like a billion devices were affected by this. That exploit was actually the result of a Patch that was deployed to cover up a backdoor that was never disclosed, that was actually put in the silicon 
ahead of time, right? And the and and the the way you can tell is that actually in the scribe line of a chip, there's a there was like a set of 256 bits that was random that's unique to every single device that was not part of the, the original path. No one actually knows exactly what it is, but the really interesting part is if you look at the chips that Apple bought, they're lasered out. So, so Apple was aware of the backdoor actually. They had done the inspection, but they didn't disclose, I guess, to the rest of the world or whatever it is. But then eventually it came out. And so this is like really interesting, like like case. And then I talked to some people who found this, and for various reasons, they can't disclose a lot of the details about what's going on. But this is like the one solid example I know. Like, like, like these people are very credible people. I don't think they made it up. I haven't seen the die shots myself, but they were, you know, I was like, okay, something like this can actually happen at the end of the day. Um, but then, you know, there's there's even kind of a, other sorts of issues as you get into, um, as, as you know, when you, when you design chip, a lot of it's vendor IP. So if you get, uh, uh, for example, an EFUSE block from TSMC, you don't actually get to see the construction of the EFUSE block itself. Actually, no one knows what's inside of it. Even I talk to people at the big chip design companies and who do security and like, I don't know what's inside my fuse box because TSMC won't show me what's inside. I can't know if there's a backdoor on the inside or not because they won't allow me to look at it, right? So there are some sort of weird existential issues with how the how the fabs operate in, in, in the IP uh, location. So we, you know, again, like you can see this project kind of goes on a lunatic fringe, but we're trying to consider all these potential vectors on it. And you're right, it would be much better if we could do a, a full, like regular silicon tape out. And in the future, I have a plan to try and do that. But in parallel with that, I also want to be able to inspect the chips at home. We can talk about it later, but I have like kind of this weird, crazy plan of, of how we can enable that. So uh, any other questions? Um, I'm just curious, so let me someone want to do like, uh, use, use this device for password management. Will they install some software from so the device itself currently, uh, yeah, you can say it shipped with the password management, it's, right? So, so uh, literally speaking, if you bought one today, you got it, you have a whole version of firmware, you got to update it. But there are published firmware that has the password management inside. So, like, um, let's say it's uh, like, I use this app to install software. It's 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 open. You can do whatever you want. Right, so so we have like a, a build that we give you that has a bunch of stuff in it. Those are basically sort of recommended defaults. You can pull down the code base and put your own software. So by the way, you know, it's not going to like that. So another architect. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but you're doing it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right, the, whole, the whole the whole idea is that is that uh, uh, it's evidence based trust. Do you trust yourself to run your own software? If you think you do it, then go for it, right? If you, but if you put it on there and you do something, but you're fine, you have done it. Right? It's like, it, it's the, the no safety. That's the it, it true, right? The Apple model is more like trust us, we have experts and professionals and we do it all right. So it's, it's, and then there's a question of like, are you everyday users smart enough to do what? They can get a lot of the whole idea. But the idea here is that it's evidence based trust. Right? So you can reason about yourself. So, uh, sorry, just one more question. Just like, let's say that the update to the OS, they be like download from the internet or users have to buy a new device. No, right, right now, updates, you have to go to a website and then run a user to upload by a script. Uploads the update. The updates are signed and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there's a, we can go into the details of the who you trust with the signature and all the script. There's a, there's a big chain of like custody question uh, for the end day. So what most the 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 actual actual end users do is that have they pull down the source code and build it locally, and then they and then they run it themselves. Um, so so that way they don't they don't trust my distribution mechanism of the software. They actually go from source, um, GitHub, all the shop, cache tree commits, and all the security there, and then they build it locally in the machine and convert it. It's pretty actually pretty quick. We get a decently fast machine and build it like two weeks or something. Sorry. Any other questions? Like, uh, three minutes or something. Yeah, yeah. I think outside of academia, you don't really see a lot of like the software that I think to be available. What do you think that is so? And like, what do you think can be like encouraging to move on? Oh, yeah. So, so that's a good question. The question is like, you know, there's, you know uh, outside of academia, it's not a lot of open source at the FPGA level. There's a, there's a group of people who are actually 
Google has been funding uh, a lot of efforts to try and get silicon more open. Um, and we've been working here to try and get that into more hands. And there's a there's actually a big project right now um, that's called Lytics that can actually you can basically write all of your software, your hardware description in Python, really easy language to code it. Um, and so it, we use that for this particular device. So if you wanted to actually look at the CT description and whatnot, uh, or the SOC description, where it's, where it's technically, uh, it's all written in Python. You can just download and start reading it today. So, so there's some things that we done in the this year. And there's also a bunch of really cheap debt for you by now, maybe like 30 40 USD, assuming you can buy them with the silicon um, So, those are reducing the barriers and the free. Um, I think the main problem beyond that is just getting people excited to write that stuff. I think most people want. To get a high paying job writing software or you know the thing or something like this. Doing doing that PGA stuff isn't a resume builder for that. And so there's a, a dilution of interest in the hardware world because it's you know the, the sex appeal isn't there, right? But if you if you if you like it, you can definitely get started with it. Time or maybe one more question. Maybe one last question. Yes, it would be ideal. Uh, for evidence, you know, I think, uh, given that I want to have this with an app store or something like this. Yeah, I think that the, the question at the end of the day becomes uh, how do you trust the app developer, right? And what's the process for doing that? I don't think an app store is impossible, but the problem is, is that we need to. You basically have to pick the person who's really taking that has to convince you that, that it's installable at the end of the day, right? The problem I have right now with a lot of like, like I, I'm in theory here right now because, like, for example, if you want to go ahead and use DDS, you have to install that app to log into their fucking website, okay? And then when you install it, it wants access to your contacts, it wants access to your location. The wants access to your phone and your files, right? And if you turn those off, it will not run. So why does the bank need to fucking know my location for plugin? Right? You know what I mean? Like, and, but and this is this is um, this is like and this is like sanctioned apps. It basically, and you read the terms of use of that app, and you when you install it, you agree that DBS can take that data and sell it to someone else. They can they can they can commoditize you as a user of their bank and this sort of stuff, right? So sure. You know, apps, you can trust who you want. They're they're bank, they should be trustable, right? I don't trust their app right, at the end of the day. And so the question at the end of the day is not so much can we solve the problem of can I take a binary object from a server and put it on a device without someone tampering? The question is who made that binary object, what are their motivation and who is approving it, right? So really more of a social and community exercise in developing a network of people that, that, that are credible that can approve these apps, right? And that is a, a huge, I mean, it's not even, I would say, an open area of research. People, we don't even know how to begin, right? How to solve that problem because it's basically unfortunate to most users, technology is magic. I'm not gonna, you know, ask an auntie here to go ahead and make a judgment. Is this app, you know, trustable or not, right? They're just gonna go, you know, it's, you might as well just, Put some lucky numbers on it and say this is, this is, a, this is a good app for you because it's good lucky numbers, right? I mean that's that's the level we're at right now talking kind of talking about technology at the end of the day. So 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 we there's a lot of education that has to go into making an app store trustable, and we, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. Anyways. This thing bunny again. The 10 minutes intermission, or we get a few on the Zoom call. Yeah, we have some people coming. So, yeah. Yeah, if you can, the little things are floating around, if they can eventually make it back here, that'd be just leave it at the table. Yeah, Phil, uh, please get started. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Okay. So, um, the topic that I propose for today is um, to talk about uh, post-quantum algorithms and quantum key distribution. Is this something that interests you folks? Um, you know, because I have other topics too. 
Uh, there's other, there's some public policy issues that have come up lately. Um, but I don't know if you guys are interested in that. Would, do you want to hear about post quantum algorithms and quantum key distribution? Yes. Yes. Or do you want me to just tell stories? <laughs> I do have stories. But actually, it's probably not good for this audio connection because, you know, there's a lot of distortion. So, okay. Um, so over the centuries, there's been an arms race between uh, cryptographers and cryptanalysts. And uh, from time to time, one side gets ahead of the other. And like during World War II, the cryptanalysts had the upper hand. And that's what they, uh, you know, they broke the German Enigma code. They, they broke the Japanese purple code. Uh, and so the cryptanalysts were ahead of the game at that time. But starting in the mid seventies, um, the cryptographers got ahead and they've been ahead ever since. Um, so when I say ahead, that means that the best crypt uh, cryptographic algorithms were out of reach of the best cryptanalytic techniques. So, but what's been happening in the last few years is that there's been a, a growing awareness that soon we may be facing um, quantum computers running Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm is an algorithm that runs uh, only on a quantum computer and it, it can factor large integers really, really fast faster than, you know, at science fiction levels of speed. Um, and, and so, you know, um, all of our public key algorithms that we have deployed right now, like RSA, like Diffie-Hellman, like elliptic curve, they would be affected by uh, Shor's algorithm. Now, everybody knows that RSA depends on the difficulty of factoring. I would assume that this audience knows this. You're all students. You probably have taken cryptographic, uh, cryptography courses. Can I see a show of hands of how many of you have, have taken a cryptography course? Nobody has taken a cryptography course? Okay. I thought this was a universal. Are, you <laughs> are, these, are these computer science students? <laughs> Yes, yes, you yeah. are. Well, I, I think it's okay. And yeah. nobody in the room has taken a cryptography course. Nobody. Wait, I think Not we... a single person has taken a cryptography course. Uh, Phil, we missed the question. Just is now. that is so, okay? So, so, so I don't want to answer because we missed the question. The audio cut off. I asked for a. I ask for people to raise their hand if they have ever taken a cryptography course in, in, at the university. Has anybody taken a cryptography course? Okay, I see like two or three hands going up. Uh, all right. And, and what about the rest of you? Did you not take a cryptography course or you, or you can't understand my voice distorted over this strange compression algorithm? I think I think some of us are still like uh, year ones and twos, so the, the course is more, for most advanced students, so not yet. Okay. Now tell me, is my voice clear? Because I, you know, <laughs> since I was having trouble hearing you guys, maybe you're having trouble hearing me. No, you sound really, really good. Uh, okay, great. All right. Um, okay, so. So the, the, the concern that everybody has now in the cryptography world is that um, quantum computers are coming and, or at least we believe they will be within 10 years, maybe 15 years. And when they get here, uh, they will be able to run uh, some, an algorithm that is specially designed to run on a quantum computer. It's called Shor's algorithm. And Shor's algorithm can factor large integers. So if you take two prime numbers and multiply them together, you get a composite number. And if you can, 
uh, it, the, the multiplication of the two primes happens at super fast speeds. It, it, you can multiply in the blink of an eye. But to factor the composite result back into the original two primes takes longer than the age of the universe. Um, but it, it goes a lot faster if you have a quantum computer running Shor's algorithm. So Shor's algorithm can factor a large integer like that in, in just a few seconds. So instead of taking the age of the universe, it takes a few seconds. That's what I mean by science fiction speeds. And that worries cryptographers because our public key algorithms, we're not worried about our block ciphers like the advanced encryption standard. We're worried about public key algorithms like RSA. There's also Diffie-Hellman. Diffie-Hellman depends on um, computing discrete logarithms but the discrete log problem is related to the factoring problem. So if you can do factoring really, really fast, you can also compute discrete logarithms really fast. So, uh, and that also applies to elliptic curve. See, all, all public key algorithms, does everybody here know what a public key algorithm is? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me see a show of hands of how many people in this room know what a public key algorithm is. Okay, I'm seeing like 60% of the hands go up. Am I to assume that 40% of the people in the room don't know what a public key algorithm is? Yes. Or is it, or is it that you just don't wanna raise your hand? <laughs> okay, so, all right, a public key algorithm. <clears throat> um, to, to, to try to shorten the explanation, because that's not the point of this lecture, I'm just gonna to try to briefly uh, define it. A public key algorithm is an algorithm where uh, the encryption and the decryption are using different keys. The keys are mathematically related, but they're not the same keys. So the traditional way of encrypting things that we've used for a couple thousand years um, is that you scramble a message using a, a, a key and it turns it into a gobbledygook, into ciphertext. And you send that message to the other party and then they use the same key to unscramble it, to decrypt it. And, and so they have to know what that key is. So that means you have to figure out some way to transport that key to the other party. That could be inconvenient. In the days of Julius Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar used to shave the head of a slave and tattoo the key on his, on his head and then let the hair grow back. And then he would send the slave to run over to the other place and they would shave his head and then they would see the key and then they could decrypt messages. That's what, that's what they did a couple thousand years ago. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> these days, they could do the uh, they could do the same thing by just you know sending a guy on an airplane with a briefcase handcuffed to his wrist and he goes to the embassy in the other country and uh, opens the suitcase and they get the cryptographic keys out but that's unwieldy that's slow that's not convenient and so public key algorithms go a long way in solving that problem um, so if if using a public key algorithm I can encrypt a message and send it to you by using your public key and you can decrypt it with your private key and your public key and your private key are related. These two keys are generated together and then separated at birth like Siamese twins. And you publish one of the keys and you keep the other one secret. And everybody who wants to encrypt messages to you uses your public key, but you're the only person who knows your private key. Um, and so that's how public key algorithms work. It, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but that's, that's the compressed explanation. Um, now, all public key algorithms are based on math problems that are easy to calculate in one direction, but really, really hard to calculate in the opposite direction. And a good example of this is the factoring problem. So with the factoring problem, you can take two large prime numbers and multiply them together. It's really, really fast for a computer to do that. It's so fast, I mean, it can be done in a few microseconds. But 
if you want to take the composite result, the result of multiplying two prime numbers together is not a prime number. It, you know, it's the product of two prime numbers. It's a composite number. To take that composite number and to try to figure out what the original two prime numbers are, that takes longer than the age of the universe. That takes billions of years of computer time. And, and, that, um, and, and so that makes it a good, the factoring problem is a good basis to construct a public key algorithm. So if you wanna have a good public key algorithm, you need to have a math problem that's really easy to compute in one direction, but you know, nearly impossible to compute, well, you know, except for the age of the universe in the opposite direction. So all of the public key algorithms that we're using today are based on either the, fa um, the factoring problem or the discrete logarithm problem. And these two problems are actually related. So it's all just the factoring problem. So RSA is, an, is a public key algorithm that is clearly based on the factoring problem. If you can factor really fast, you can break RSA. Um, Diffie-Hellman is another public key algorithm, but it's based on the discrete log problem. And that problem is related to factoring. So if you can build a computer that can factor really, really fast, you can also compute discrete logarithms really, really fast. And so Diffie-Hellman would also break. So RSA and Diffie-Hellman would both be broken by a quantum computer running Shor's algorithm. And that's what has all the cryptographers worried. Cryptographers are losing sleep about this. We're worried that soon all the public key algorithms that we've designed into TLS and you know, VPNs and PGP and SSH and um, you know, Bitcoin and uh, signature algorithms and uh, what else, you know, the onion router, um, the, all, these, all these tools that we have that, use, uh, that uses public key cryptography, all these tools are gonna fail when somebody comes up with a, a quantum computer that can run Shor's algorithm against large keys. They've already demonstrated quantum computers that can run Shor's algorithm on very, very small keys. Small keys, meaning like two prime numbers multiplied together, like the number three times the number five. Those are two prime numbers, three and five. You multiply them together, the answer is 15. So we have quantum computers today that can take the number 15, it's a composite number, and factor it into two primes, three times five. whoop de doo <laughs> All of you can do that in your head. You don't need a computer for that. So quantum computers are not very far along right now. It, they're, it's very hard to build quantum computers of sufficient complexity to do this. But 10 years in the future, or maybe 15 years in the future, we'll probably have, they think that probably we'll have quantum computers that can do this. So this is why cryptographers are really, really worried. And so they are trying to come up with new math problems that are not related to factoring. So if we can just find some other math problems that satisfy this, this requirement, that it's easy to calculate in one direction, but very slow to calculate in the opposite direction. We can do that. We know of several math problems that are like that. And, uh, but the requirement is that it, it should have nothing to do with factoring because factoring is what quantum computers will be able to do. And, and so if we're gonna find new public key algorithms, they have to be based on math problems that have nothing to do with factoring. So we have some of those problems. And um, these new public key algorithms are called post-quantum algorithms because they're designed to be used in a world with quantum computers. If your opponent has a quantum computer, you need to be using a post-quantum algorithm instead of RSA or instead of Diffie-Hellman or instead of elliptic curve. You have to replace those with new algorithms, post-quantum algorithms. And so a lot of mathematicians are working on this now. And for the past few years, NIST, the standards body in the United States, has uh, had a competition 
for um, people to submit candidate algorithms that can um, that can replace public key algorithms that we're using today. And so right now uh, they're in the final stages of that competition. Um, there were a lot of submitted algorithms and they've been um, whittled down to uh, just a, a few algorithms that are that remain. And so once they issue a new standard with these new algorithms, then we'll be able to uh, start using them. But we shouldn't wait that long because here's the problem. Um, yes, it, it, it could be 10 or 15 years in the future when we see quantum computers that have sufficient complexity to uh, break the currently deployed tools that we use today. Uh, but we can't wait that long. We have to, um, just a moment. Yeah. Uh, we have to find um, these algorithms faster and start using them immediately. Because right now we're generating traffic that's encrypted with public key algorithms that will be broken in the future. So that means that somebody could record the traffic, they could intercept the traffic, they could archive it on you know, big disk farms and then decrypt it 10 years from now or 15 years from now. Now, maybe you're talking over encrypted channels using public key algorithms and you don't care if somebody reads it 10 years from now. Maybe you're only worried about it today, but 10 years from now, it won't matter if somebody can read it. But there are some conversations that you have where you do care, where you're worried about somebody listening or reading your, your messages 10 years from now or 15 years from now, because they're so sensitive that it, they could be damaging even then. In that case, you have to worry about the archive today, analyze tomorrow problem. Uh, the NSA has these has built a facility in the Utah desert that has it's huge and it's full of disk drives. It's about the size of a Tesla Gigafactory. So imagine a building that large, packed with disk drives. That's a lot of disk drives, and they're archiving encrypted traffic. They can't decrypt it today. They don't know what it is. It's encrypted traffic. They know who sent it and who, who the sender and receiver was, but they don't know what the contents are. So they're archiving it. They're hoping that many years in the future, they'll figure out what those keys are, probably using a quantum computer. And so that's why you have to worry. And, and the NSA is not the only organization doing it. The Chinese are very likely doing it also. So, um, so we can't wait um, for the long process to, to finish about picking new post-quantum algorithms to become a standard. We have to start using these post-quantum algorithms immediately. We can't wait until the, the slow standards process um, finishes because we're generating traffic today that can be analyzed tomorrow, archived today, analyzed tomorrow. So there is, um, there is another way to solve this problem. Instead of using post-quantum algorithms, we can use physics. Um, <clears throat> The physics community has looked at this problem and they wanna solve it with physics using a technique called quantum key distribution. And what they do is they, they generate photons to send through a fiber optic cable. And you, you generate pairs of photons and they're entangled, um, they're, po they're polarized. So one of them is polarized vertically and the other one's polarized horizontally, except that you don't know which is which. Um, they're, they're, they're polarized in both orientations until you observe one of them. And if you observe one of them, you'll know which way it's polarized, vertically or horizontally. But if you do that, the other one will change and will become polarized the, the opposite way. 
And we say that these are entangled photons. And even if these photons are far from each other, they could be a thousand miles apart or they could even be at opposite ends of the galaxy. They're, they're linked together with, with quantum entanglement. And if you observe one of them, it will collapse the other one from its, its uh, state of being in both uh, states. How many of you have heard of Schrodinger's cat? Have you heard of Schrodinger's cat? Ah, this more hands are going up. This is like everybody in the room has heard of Schrodinger's cat. I'm glad that there's something. <laughs> um, so the cat is both alive and dead at the same time until you open the box and look inside and then the cat is either dead or alive. Not both, it's gotta be one or the other. But before you open the box, the cat is both dead and alive. I saw a t-shirt, it had one of those wanted posters. Remember like in the American West back in the 19th century, they had these wanted posters, some bank robber would said, wanted, dead or alive, Jesse James, you know, and <laughs> wanted, dead or alive. So I saw a t-shirt that had one of those old fashioned wanted posters with a cat and it said, wanted, Schrodinger's cat, dead or uh, dead and alive. <laughs> um, so these two photons are linked together, they're entangled and both of them are simultaneously vertically polarized and horizontally polarized at the same time. But if you observe one of them, that's like opening the box for Schrodinger's cat. If you observe one of them, now you know, is it vertically polarized or is it horizontally polarized? It's not both at the same time. After you examine one, after you intercept one and put it through a detector, then you know, oh, it's horizontally polarized or it's vertically polarized, not both. And if you do that, it simultaneously affects the other photon. So now the other photon is not both at the same time. It's also collapsed the entanglement is not there anymore. The other one is collapsed into the other state, the opposite state. And it's possible to communicate photons through a fiber optic cable that are entangled this way. And you can make it so that if somebody intercepted these photons, you would know, you would detect it. And, and that makes it possible to reach an, a key agreement. The motivation for using public key algorithms is so that these two people, Alice and Bob, can agree on a session key. The session key is used to encrypt the whole conversation. But you have to agree on a session key in advance. And that's where you use a public key algorithm. You use the public key algorithm to encrypt a session key. You send that to the other party. Now you both know the session key and you use that with a, a, a block cipher or a symmetric cipher like the advanced encryption standard to, to encrypt the whole conversation. I mean, right now, it's very likely that um, probably there's some kind of encryption going on in this uh, Zoom link. And the session key was agreed upon by using um, probably TLS. And, or, or some other public key algorithm. And, um, and, and so what the quantum key distribution guys want to do is use quantum key distribution to distribute keys. That's why it's called quantum key distribution. You send the session key through this channel of entangled photons. And if somebody intercepts them, you can figure out that it was intercepted. You can detect it because the other photon becomes unentangled, it, it collapses. It's, it's, in a, it's, it's, it's in a state of, it's, it's a transposition state. It's both states at once, but it becomes deterministic of only one state. And that's something you can detect. And so once you use quantum key distribution to agree on a session key, then you can use the session key to encrypt the rest of the conversation. The problem is that this only works through fiber optic cables. And they can't be very long. They, they can only be like 100 kilometers long. And that's not very useful for the whole internet. Like right now, you, you and I are separated by, uh, you know, we're on opposite sides of the planet right now. And, and so 
being able to do this only through 100 kilometers of fiber optic cable is just not good enough. We need something that can use the span of the entire internet. And that you can also do it with lasers in space between satellites or, or maybe even between a satellite and a ground station. But you can't use it through cell towers. You can't use it through uh, copper uh, twisted pair wire like ethernet cable. You can't use it through Wi-Fi. You can't use it through 3G or 4G or 5G. Um, you can't use it through Bluetooth. You can't use it through any of those things. The only thing you can use it for is sending photons either between satellites with a, with a laser in space or through a fiber optic cable. And so that means that <clears throat> it doesn't solve enough of the problem. Um, it's, it's even worse than that because even if you could send it through very, very long fiber optic cables, it still wouldn't solve the problem because <clears throat> if you want to send internet packets, the internet packets have packet headers that contain the IP address of where you're sending the packet. And the router has to parse that packet header to see what the IP address is. And examining that IP address in the packet header would disrupt the entanglement of these photons and they would collapse from their transposition into a determined state. And so you'd ruin it. So routers can't really be used. Well, that really, you know, that, that makes it hard to make anything work right. Um, so quantum key distribution, it, it's, a, it's a good example of how people, when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? You know, oh, I have a hammer. <laughs> Show me the nails. I want to pound some nails. That's all I can do is pound nails. Um, uh, quantum key distribution is invented by physicists. I, I majored in physics before I switched to computer science when I was at the university. Um, and so I like physics and I, I like the beauty and elegance of quantum key distribution, but it's it has no practical value. Um, you need something that you can use for portable computing devices. It's got to be used through cell towers. It's got to be used through Wi-Fi. It's got to be used through copper wire, twisted pair, ethernet cables. It's got to be used in all different layers of uh, physical layers of the internet. And quantum key distribution won't do any of that. It can only be used in a, in a particular kind of physical layer that allows unobstructed photons to travel. So um, that's why we need to use quantum uh, post-quantum algorithms to solve this problem, not quantum key distribution. China has been launching satellites to do this. Um, I don't know if they how far along they're getting, but they they did launch some satellites to do it with lasers, and they're also doing it through fiber optic cable. But they have to have a, they have to have a repeater every hundred kilometers, and they also that also allows somebody to wiretap it. So they have these little little buildings with, with you know, rack mounted equipment that you could wiretap and they put armed guards protecting that little building. And, and so nobody's allowed to get in the building. They'll shoot you if you try to get in. Um, but every, every 100 kilometers, they have to have armed guards protecting some equipment. And that's just insane. You know, that's not a solution. In fact, it's just another problem. It's worse than the original problem. Uh, so quantum key distribution is definitely not the right approach. Post-quantum algorithms is the way to go. And we're, in a, we're preparing to migrate to post-quantum algorithms and we have to do the migration as soon as we can. So let's open it up for questions. There's somebody in the back with his hand up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you were saying that we could use uh, you know, these post quantum algorithms today, but which of the instant vendors would you recommend us to start looking at? There's several of them on the table. Well, you know, it's funny. I actually prefer one that was eliminated. Um, in the competition. There's something called N true prime by, uh, uh, by Dan Bernstein. 
And uh, Dan Bernstein is, is really good at what he does. He's, he's the guy who invented the term post-quantum algorithms. Um, and so he's got, there's, what seems to be the general consensus is that they wanna use, um, the math problem that underlies it is, uh, involves lattices. And so there were several candidate algorithms that were based on these lattices. And one of them, Dan Bernstein's algorithm is um, called N true prime. And there's, they didn't pick that. The, they, the one that they picked is a different one. But one of the problems that we have is that there may be patent claims on the one that they picked. And I'm worried about these patent claims because if we make that a standard and everybody starts using it, then the guy with the patent could stand up and say, hey, wait, you can't use it. You have to pay me lots of money to use it. So the one that Dan came up with doesn't seem to be encumbered by patent. So I like that one better. There's also other things that he did that makes it a better algorithm. But N true prime is, is my favorite at the moment. I, you know, there was another one that was broken a, a couple of months ago uh, called SIDH, Super Singular Isogeny Diffie Hellman. And it was spectacularly shattered to smithereens. And so um, it was kind of scary that it got so far into the competition before it was broken. Yeah, uh, one of the difficulties is that there's not enough qualified mathematicians uh, doing peer review. You know, I used to be able to look at these algorithms, not these, but, you know, the block cipher algorithms used in the AES competition in the late 90s. I could look at all of those and try to understand them. Or hash functions, you know, the SHA-3 competition. Um, you know, I could look at those and try to figure out how they work. But when it comes to post-quantum algorithms, the math is just too hard for me. You know, I'm an applied cryptographer. I'm not a theoretician. And so the number of qualified mathematicians that can do peer review is smaller for, for the post-quantum algorithm competition compared to previous competitions NIST had for hash functions and block ciphers. So it is kind of worrisome, but um, it is what it is. You know, we, we can't wait any longer. Yeah, I guess maybe the, the following question is, is you, you're saying that the first hand algorithm should have been picked, but you know, I remember also if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, this big like P two fifty six or something like this, and curve two point five and nine were you picking out also the end algorithm. Sorry, there's a lot of distortion. I'm uh, try try again slowly. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, you you were mentioning about the NIST process. And basically, what I was getting at, how much confidence do you have the NIST process is not influenced? by parties that want it to be weaker than it should be. Like, was Dan algorithm thrown out because, you know, uh, bad? Well, yeah, okay, the, the problem is, is if they pick something that isn't part of an open competition. You know, for example, some years ago, they, they recommended a random number generator that was given to them by the NSA, and it had a back door. Well, they published it in one of their documents, along with two other really good random number generators. So this, this document had three random number generators in it. Uh, that's in, you know, random number generators are used to generate random numbers for cryptographic keys. So one of them had a back door and everybody could, who looked at it look, thought that it was a bad design and everybody suspected it had a back door. It turns out it did have a back door. But the other two algorithms were excellent algorithms, especially the one I like especially is the one based on hash functions. Uh, so, but picking a new standard, the AES competition was an open competition and they had uh, you know, some really good uh, competitors. They were also some stupid ones that got eliminated quickly. But the five finalists back in the late 90s, the five finalists were all excellent block ciphers. Any one of them could have been a, a good choice for the advanced encryption standard. They picked one that was faster than the other ones. And that was, that was good because speed is important. Uh, later, they had another competition for hash functions. And, um, you know, it's an open competition. And so, you know, you eliminate the stupid ones. 
all the cryptographers are engaged in a demolition derby. They're trying to uh, they're trying to destroy their competitors because they want to win. They want their algorithm to win. And so this is a very, uh, you know, bloody competition, which is the way it should be. So it's good to have an open competition. It's not good to select something without transparency. And that, and, and, the, and the, the most spectacular example of how not to do it was that random number generator. They got rid of it. Uh, you know, this was humiliated by this revelation. By the way, the revelation was uh, in the Snowden material. But all the cryptographers suspected there was a backdoor even before Snowden revealed it. So I, I would never use it. Uh, no cryptographers that I know would ever use it. But, you know, um, anyway. So right now, um, you know, we have to come up with new public key algorithms that can withstand quantum computers. And um, what worries me is, is there's not enough peer review. And also it's possible that there will be some patents that cover something. And if that happens, that'll be bad if they pick an algorithm that's covered by a patent. Thank you. So anyone else? I think I see another hand in the back there. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can question, hear you. My question is, uh, uh, what's your opinion on uh, the fact that uh, currently there are quite a few big companies such as JP Morgan and uh, Goldman Sachs, they are heavily investing in on the I'm having trouble, I, I'm having trouble understanding you. Uh, uh, actually, uh, what's your opinion on the fact that Currently, we have there are quite a few big companies such as JP Morgan and uh, Goldman Sachs. They are heavily investing in quantum computation instead of so called quantum computing. Okay, can somebody repeat the question? Um, you know, um, the first guy I talked to with the microphone had a more clear. Uh, I, I was able to more clearly understand them. So can you repeat that question? Uh, not, not the guy who was just speaking, because I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble. Uh, the, the audio quality here is terrible. So can somebody repeat the question? Can you just say, say the question again? Uh, just quick. Oh, my question is just like, uh, just mentioned that you take often distribution tool. Oh, okay. Now, yeah, you were saying that the quantum key distribution is not practical, but he was asking, he said there's some large banks and stuff that seem to be investing in some quantum key distribution or some quantum cryptography thing. He was wondering, you just want to hear your opinion more about like their approach and why they might be doing this. Why would they be putting money into something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Every cryptographer that I know agrees with me about this. Uh, we think it's a waste of money. The, look, the physics works. <laughs> it's beautiful and elegant. I, you know, I, as I said, I majored in physics in college before I switched to computer science. So I love the physics of quantum key distribution. It's a, it's a, you know, it's an elegant, beautiful demonstration of, of physics and quantum mechanics and quantum entanglement. And, um, you know, I, aesthetically it's very pleasing, but it doesn't solve the problem well enough. It only solves it in a very narrow circumstance. If all you need is some way to, to communicate over a hundred kilometers of fiber optic cable, and you're not sending it through the internet, then yeah, you can make it work. But if you want to try to solve it for the, the whole of society and everybody's going through the internet, it, there's no way you can do that with quantum key distribution. So, um, you know, I think that for people doing pure physics research, you know, if you want to do it, fine. I, you know, if you have some way to get money to do it, then fine. 
But if somebody's putting money in because they think this is going to solve our problem for how to how to you know handle enemies with um, quantum computers running Shor's algorithm, quantum key distribution is not going to solve the problem. Not that problem. It's not going to solve any problem really. You know, <laughs> it's a good physics demonstration. It's it is it is a beautiful, elegant demonstration of physics and quantum mechanics, but it's just not. It's, it doesn't solve the, the real practical problem of getting Alice and Bob to agree on a session key. You know, in Europe, they're, they're spending money on this. Luxembourg and, and, and the Netherlands and maybe some other Western European countries are spending money to launch a satellite to send down a laser from space to carry, you know, keys. And it's it's... It's a waste of money. <laughs> you know, if they want to do it for pure research, fine, but they're spending an awful lot of money. We should be spending that money on migrating to post-quantum algorithms. We need to we need to find good post-quantum algorithms. And, and, and you know, it's going to be hard and expensive. We have to, you know, change all the software stacks, every TLS stack, open SSL, you know, SSH. All the PGP implementations, the you know, um, all the VPNs, you know, IPsec, um, all, all the places where we're using public key algorithms today, we have to replace those. It's going to take a lot of time and money and manpower to do it. Um, so that's where we should be putting our resources, and we should we should try to do it soon. Any other questions? Uh, Phil, we actually have questions from Zoom. So, um, okay. Yeah, you can open the chat. Uh, and I think there is a question right now in the chat. Okay. Where do I find that? Uh, just a moment. I'm looking on the user interface here. There's uh, something about participants. Maybe there's something there. Uh, do you see okay, a chat? I see, I see that there's it, there's a list of participants, 11. Yep. Um, um, right beside the participants button, do you see a chat? Oh, there, yes. There's chat, yes. There we go. Okay, I can see that. Uh, so what am I looking for here? That's a question from Steve. Oh, recommendations for people that use TLS. You know, everybody uses TLS. We're using TLS right now. Um, you know, yeah. The the this the the stacks that everybody's using, OpenSSL, for example, they have to be revised to use post quantum algorithms. And, um, and one of the things that worries me is, is the possibility of um, somebody having patents, you know? Um, somebody could sit on patents and not tell anyone about them, make it secret patents, you know? Um, and, and then later jump up and say, aha, everybody's now using this. Well, I have a patent on it. And now all of you have to pay me, you know, a trillion dollars to use it. So that's something that worries me. <laughs> Usually enterprises that use TLS, <clears throat> they're not, they don't have their own TLS stack. You know, they're using TLS that's embedded in other products like web browsers or mail agents or, um, you know, that, you know, they have, they have TLS hosted on a server and, um, they're using an open source implementation of TLS. So they should make sure they're using something that has these post quantum algorithms. Let's see. Just a moment. Um, yeah, there's one more um, from Clyde. Um, do you see in the chat? Yeah, I think he's, he's questioning how realistic is it that someone's going to build a quantum computer of sufficient complexity. That's a good question because, you know, up until, up in, well, I don't know, some years ago, maybe um, 
six or seven years ago, I didn't believe anybody was ever going to build a quantum computer of sufficient complexity. I thought it was just too hard. Uh, there have been advances in applied physics that seem to suggest that maybe they'll figure out a way to, so to solve this. But they don't know how to do it now. They only do it for trivially small numbers of qubits. Now, there's actually two variants of quantum computers. Um, <clears throat> there's the one that I worry about, which is one that can uh, run Shor's algorithm. But there are other ways to use qubits in a, in, in a sort of different kind of quantum computer. There's a company called D-Wave that has very large numbers of qubits, but it can't do general calculations. It can't run Shor's algorithm, for example, but it, you can use the qubits to solve optimization problems. And that's a worthwhile area, uh, you know, it's, it can be useful for some things. You might have some applications in artificial intelligence or, or optimization problems, um, but it's not gonna run Shor's algorithm. So we're still a long way from running Shor's algorithm for large keys at the recommended key sizes that we're all using today. But that's not what I'm worried about. I'm not worried about <clears throat> these quantum computers that we have now breaking what we have now. I'm worried about someone archiving intercepted communications today and storing it. Uh, and then 10 years from now, <clears throat> or 15 years from now, maybe then they can use a quantum computer that exists at that time and retroactively analyze the traffic that they intercepted today. You know, uh, NSA has done uh, um, crypt analysis for uh, traffic that they archived many decades earlier. In World War II, the, the, the Soviets were using one-time paths and um, we intercepted their messages. We didn't know how to break them, but we archived them. Postcard. And, and it turns out that the Soviets um, had a, a special bureau in the Soviet government that was responsible for generating their one-time bad material, which is a, a bunch of random numbers. And because it's so expensive to generate this material, they decided to save money by using it twice. So they would, this bureau would sell this to the Navy, the Soviet Navy, but they would also sell it to the Soviet army or maybe the KGB or something like that. And so these two different parts of the Soviet military industrial complex were using the same one-time pad material, which is a no-no. It's called a one-time pad for a reason. If you use the, the, the key material twice, then it, it breaks, the whole thing breaks. And so um, <clears throat> the US government and the British intercepted a lot of these messages and archived them. And then over several decades, uh, they were able to uh, figure out that they had used uh, one-time pad material that was used twice and they were able to break it. This was called Project Venona. And you can look it up in Wikipedia, Project Venona, V-E-N-O-N-A. And um, they were able to you know, decrypt the, the Soviet traffic from World War II. So don't cheat. If you're gonna use a one-time pad, first of all, you shouldn't use a one-time pad because it's a stupid way to do it. Yes, it cannot be broken, but you have to generate such huge amounts of key material that it's not practical. In fact, it's so not practical that it's why they cheated. It's why they used it twice. I'm digressing. I think that what I'm trying to say is um, you have to be concerned about intercepted traffic today being decrypted in the, in the future, many years in the future. So that's why we have to move quickly. We can't keep generating this traffic that will someday be compromised. Uh, the uh, the post quantum algorithm that I mentioned earlier is called N true prime by Dan Bernstein. Uh, there's a question here asking me about that. Let's see. Um, we're here's a question: How close are are we to deciding? Well, they pretty much now have picked 
what they're going to standardize. Um, they're at round four, which is the final round. And so one of the algorithms that they were about to standardize is called super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman, SIDH. And it was broken a couple of months ago. Really broken, spectacularly broken, smashed to smithereens broken. Uh, and, and so that was pretty scary. You know, oh my God, somebody broke one of those. What about the other algorithms? Is somebody gonna break those too? Uh, you know, for, I mean, the one that they broke was the one that had, um, was the newest one, you know, it had not, didn't have as many years of people attacking it. So, you know, it's generally a good idea to use things that are mature, that have been around for a long time. Some of these have been around for a long time. Um, there's one called Macaulay's that's been around since the seventies, but the keys are too big to be practical. So, um, yeah, so if you go on Google and type um, post-quantum NIST, you'll, you'll, go, you'll find their website and, they, and you can, there's PDF files. You can download and read the white papers that describe the algorithms. But you have to have a strong math background to do that. I, I, I don't know. You know, I've tried to read some of these papers. It's too much for me. I had no idea how super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman works. I couldn't even get past the abstract. It was just too hard. The math was too hard. Maybe you can have one last question from the live audience. Uh, okay, here's a question. Um, will post-quantum algorithms be widely adopted given their larger key sizes and, the, and um, complexity? They're not that slow, they're really, they're, they're really very fast. Uh, it's just the keys are inconveniently large. But, you know, look, um, we use elliptic curve a lot now, and that's a much smaller key size than, say, the original RSA algorithm. Some of these keys that they're using are, you know, a bit larger than RSA, but they're not impossibly large. Macaulay's is impossibly large. Their keys are like a megabyte in size. A megabyte. Imagine having a key that's a megabyte in size. That's ridiculous. But the other ones based on lattices, their key sizes are a couple thousand bytes. Ah, oh, a couple thousand bytes. That sounds really bad, right? But what else are we going to do? You know, if we're going to try to cope with quantum computers in the hands of our opponents, we're going to have to put up with some inconvenience. So, <clears throat> um, a couple of years back, I um, was, I, I did a project with, uh, you know, there's a VPN called WireGuard. Perhaps some of you have heard of WireGuard. WireGuard is based on elliptic curve. And uh, uh, me and a couple of my colleagues came up with a, a version of WireGuard that had post-quantum algorithms. And so, uh, you know, and we did a lot of testing on it and it, it, it's still fast enough. But the keys are, well, they barely fit. Um, so more questions? All right, Phil, I think uh, we, are, we are okay for now. No one has any more okay. questions. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, sorry about the audio difficulties at the start. Um, yeah. Okay. All right then. Perfectly silent clapping. I guess we lost audio. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill. Okay. Bye. Yep. Bye. <laughs>